tokens as your identity API is what we're going to talk about now. Yes, we'll try to do a, a short demo in the middle. It's always fun, see if the internet works, all those things. Um, about me, uh, Jakob Ederskog, I work at a company called Curity. Um, what I do most of the days is work with OAuth and OpenID Connect. We're building an OAuth server, an OpenID Connect provider, those type of things. Uh, so we dive into the details quite a lot. So a lot of my days go into figuring out what the specs really mean, how to implement them in a good way, in a usable way. There's a lot of useless stuff out there. And, and sort of dive into this. And, and today I'm going to give you sort of a snapshot of where, where we are currently. Where's the, where's the community? What's going on? And uh, I'm going to talk particularly about the tokens. What goes into tokens? Uh, so I'm assuming a bit you have some idea what OAuth is. If you don't, you can Google it. <laughs> there, are some good, uh, there are some good videos where we do some basic explanations of OAuth and OpenID. But don't worry, you don't need that much. Another way to present myself is to use some attributes or properties about me. I have a name, Jacob. I have an age, 38-ish. Um, I have a height. I'm 177 centimeters tall. I'm a father. I have a son. When this picture was taken, it was sunny. We were at some cafe. That's some presentation about me as well that someone might use. Show a picture of me and, and say, this is Jacob. When I go online, on the other hand, similar properties about me are useful. Um, I have still have a height. That could be useful if I'm buying a shirt or a, a pair of pants or something at a clothing store. Shirt size might be relevant. Might be relevant where I am when I'm doing that, and so on. Um, but I'm skipping ahead a bit. In order to sort of dive into what I mean by, by tokens as APIs, we need to split this talk into three parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about where are we today? Where, where's the security community and where's the implementation? What are people using? And to do that, I define the model that I call the API security maturity model, uh, which I bluntly stole from the REST maturity model. Uh, so you'll recognize it. And this is where a lot of things started. Um, level zero, if you will. We have API keys and basic authentication. Still widely used out there. And still goes in under API security, obviously. Um, so if we, if we dive into this as an example, and we use this store that I just had. We have me wanting to buy a shirt. Um, I log into the store, they have data about me, or I have provided it at some point. Which means, when I buy something, they could you know, show the right sizes, tell me if it's in stock, those type of things. But interestingly, a store probably looks more like this. There's some web front end, um, or you know, web service. There's probably an app version of this store. There's a lot of versions. So they broke it apart and had some APIs in the back. Uh, an inventory API, perhaps, and a purchase API. Super simple. If we use level zero of the API security maturity model, when I make a purchase, the clothing store sort of web site would make these requests, perhaps, passing an authorization header with basic auth or an API key um, to the API to authenticate. If they need to pass information about me, that goes into the body or into some other head header. There's no way to do that just using the mechanism of basic auth. So that's, that's level zero. What's the problem with that? Well, we can, I could list you know, this whole session about problems with that. But let's start. It's, first of all, machine verification-ish. It's service-to-service -service verification. We're not really authenticating or taking the user into account when doing this. It's the machine we're, we're checking. Are you allowed to talk to me? And there are many ways to do this. Basic auth is one. Mutual TLS is another. There's a lot. Um, and like I said, the user isn't bound to the resource here. So the call goes and says, yes, you can call me, and I trust that when you call me, you'll do the right thing. Whoops. Sensitive buttons. Uh, third point. It's authentication only. We're not really providing any means for the API to do any authorization. Authorization, answering the question, what are you allowed to do? Whereas authentication, answering the question, 
who are you? So we're checking who's the machine calling us. We're not ask, uh, figuring out what are you allowed to do. That has to be custom. So that's level zero. Then OAuth came along. Um, OAuth 1 came along, not super broadly adopted, which is why OAuth 2 was in invented, because OAuth 1 was simply too hard to implement uh, for the client. And if you want a lot of users on your API, you don't want to make it very hard to implement the security model that you chose. So OAuth 2 was designed to sort of address this, and OAuth 1 is no more. It's, it's obsolete. So token-based authentication. Obviously, I generalized it, so there could be other protocols, but there aren't any, actually. Uh, so likelihood, if you're using another protocol, you, you built it on your own, or it's some obscure uh, project that someone else built. So it's likely to have issues. So OAuth is what we're talking about. So what do I mean by token-based authentication? Let's have another example. Let's consider a publisher, say a newsroom or, or something like that. They figured we need token-based authentication or token-based architecture in our, in our network. And the organization decided, uh, let's have an API for content where reporters can log into the machine and they can publish stuff to this content API. And then our channels out calls this content API and publishes it. So reporter signs in and then makes a request, new article, and then somebody uses a tablet on the internet, surfs to their website, and can re read this article. If we use token-based authentication, it means that bearer tokens would be flying around, access tokens. Um, the user would probably log in with something like a code flow, you know what? Which is nice, because then the user is actually in the token, problem solved of the first thing we talked about. Um, but the website couldn't do that, so the website could use another flow called the client credentials flow, where it gets a token even though it doesn't have a user, and fetches content. Bear with me here. It's, it's kind of made up, and kind of not, actually. <laughs> I've seen something similar. So the, the token uh, coming from the website, the reason we can't have a user there is because usually a new site is open. You don't have to authenticate to go and read articles. So we can't really rely on a user being on the other end. So this sounds pretty good. So still, we're just using access tokens now for authentication, answering the question, who are you? So we changed sort of one problem for another. We're still not checking or using any, any standardized way of figuring out what you're allowed to do. So any um, authorization decisions that this content API has to do has to be custom. You have to code a lot. And likelihood is it's not done or it's not done properly. And actually, we have machine access to the same API where we have user access. So some of these requests going in and changing the content is where a user is involved, where other access coming from the web, where the, only the web backend is calling and no user is involved. So we have machine access and user access to the same API. So we can't really rely on that user parameter in the token because sometimes it's a machine. So the result can be that anyone who obtains an access token can update the content API. So you just put a layer of security around it and said, it's hard to get a token, it's enough, if you have one, you can do stuff with this API. Turns out, though, if you're a news organization, this is super problematic. Because anyone inside your organization who gets a token, if they can update the API, they can actually publish data. And as a news organization, you're responsible for what gets published. In Sweden, at least, you can go to jail if you publish slander or other things. It's severe. So, you're thinking you're protecting yourself by adding this layer, but it's not enough. It's just sort of the, the bare minimum of what we need to do. Which brings us to the third layer, or level two, if we start at zero. Token-based authorization. And this is, this is, I would say, almost state of the art today. Uh, but I'm going to talk about where we need to be. But token-based authorization we're using something called scopes. How many in here have heard of scopes? Good, great, most. 
So scopes, for you who don't know, they're named permissions in a token, <laughs> in OAuth. Um, they're strings, or a string, actually. They don't contain any values. They're just atoms or names. And they're requested by the client. And then the OAuth server authorizes this request together with the user. So the user can consent and say, yes, I will release this, this access to this API. Hmm? That's what scopes are. To give you an example, we have three APIs, users, contents, and invoices. Um, the content API, for instance, that we had in the previous one. I could have two scopes, content read, content write. You can make scopes up. You know, there are no defined scopes in OAuth. So you can make them up. And you can say, yeah, a client who doesn't authenticate a user can only get the content read scope. A client who does authenticate a user using the code flow or something similar um, can get the content write scope. Problem solved. Super simple to, to use that for authorization mechanisms in the API because you can block entire applications from doing things that they're not supposed to do in your OWASP server, in your central party. Very, very useful. There are other scopes. OpenID defines a bunch. I'll talk about them later. Email and address are two of those. Uh, invoice list. If we have an invoice API, I want to list, I want to read, I want to write. I mean, it's good to group functions using scopes. That's what's going on currently in a lot of places. So you say, we have this new API. It can do these functions. Do we need a new scope, or can we use something that exists? So the API team kind of defines, yeah, we have you know, this group of access. Um, and then the, the sort of identity team or the ones responsible for OAuth says, sure, let's add that and let's figure out what clients may need this and then they can get tokens to access the data. So the newsroom would have that. As, th that would be a non-issue then. It, like the client from the web could never update data. And you could restrict it so that very few clients could do something and the user had to be involved. So you could have auditability on who did what. Much better. <clears throat> in Sweden, we have an app called the Swish app. I know you have something similar here in Denmark. I don't remember the name. Maybe MobiPay? Could it be? Mobile Pay. Um, same thing, essentially. It's provided by the banks. It's an app where I can transfer money to anyone who has a phone number and that app. So all I need is a bank account and a phone number, sign up, and transfer money super quickly. Sweet. Um, Swish kind of works like this in Sweden. We also have another app called Bank ID. I know you have an MID. There are others in other countries. Um, Bank ID in Sweden has a mobile app. So a lot of apps, especially banking, use that for identification to figure out who you are. It's, it's kind of like an EID, or it is an EID, except it's not from the government. Um, so when I open the Swish app, it opens Bank ID in turn. And at the same time, the Swish backend, backend will call Bank ID and say, hey, I need to log in here and start polling for a session. Uh, Bank ID will authenticate me. And once that's done, it will return access to the, to the app. And the app will then context switch to Swish. It will close itself or get in the background. And Swish will come in the foreground. And at the same time, the Swish backend will communicate with Bank ID and figure out, oh, user logged in, great. And they haven't released the exact details of this, but I would imagine if you do this with a code flow, you'd be peachy. Uh, so the, the user who's logged in now into the app can have very restricted access to the APIs it calls. And let's just assume that they're using the scope-based access control. So the, the APIs called from the Swish application can only do the things we designed them to do. They, can on, they cannot um, create new accounts, for instance. They can only read accounts, stuff like that. So what happened, though? Maybe you guys heard of this, but a couple of years ago, or a year ago, I think, um, some guy wanted to reverse engineer the Swish protocol that they use and found their pin certificate in the app that they use to communicate. So he found that, picked it up, built a proxy in the middle so the app would trust that proxy, and then he could talk to the Swish backend. Got to assume that can happen. You can't really lock, it down, lock down an app more than that anyway. What he figured then, he, was, he saw this API where you list all your previous transactions. So he said, payment history slash my phone number slash all lists all your previous transactions. However, if you put someone else's phone number in there, 
you list all their transactions. That's a nice feature. So the thing is, <laughs> scope-based access control does nothing to prevent this, because we still can list transactions. That's fine. I mean, the app is allowed to list transactions, but we didn't involve the user here. What can the user do? Yeah, the user could obviously list transactions of anything it wanted. And this is a general problem if we think about how we're starting to build our microservices and APIs today. We're passing a lot of information around. And all of a sudden, one of them needs to call it a, a, a sort of downstream API. And they need more data in order to make that API call, so they look it up. Phone number. I need the phone number in order to do this thing I'm going to do now. That's not given to me. I'll, I'll look it up and forward it down in the next request. And then maybe the request circles around a bit before being returned. I mean, you can just imagine. So what could go wrong with that? Who do we trust? Who trusts who? I mean, the one who looked up the phone number, do I trust that caller? So what can happen when an API calls another API, or when a service calls another service, or an app calls an API? We need to know who we're trusting. Otherwise, we get something we call a spaghetti of trust. And this is, this is not new. It's been around for ages. SAML had this problem as well. It's super easy to sort of forget who adds information along the way and then sort of rely on that. So in the Swish case, they trusted the, the app to make the correct API call. That was a big mistake. Luckily, you couldn't do the same thing on transfer money. But that was maybe just luck. <laughs> Who knows? So that brings us to the top level here. We need something we call centralized trust using claims. So this takes a bit more explaining. Claims, the missing piece. OAuth doesn't talk a whole lot about claims. Um, but OpenID does, so we're going to dive into that. But let's start with trust. I, I mentioned spaghetti, and we need to get out of that. So who do we trust in our network? Do we trust the caller? Well, we just figure out we don't. We don't trust the caller, <laughs> at least not a lot. We, do we trust the API gateway? Well, yeah, to some extent we trust the API gateway. But does the API gateway look up extra information and add it in the request going back? How does it add the information? that it sends for backwards in the network? Do we trust the issuer of the token? If we're sending tokens around, do we trust the issuer? Well, who, who can issue tokens? Do you have libraries creating jots in your network in the middle? Do we trust the user database? Who can access the database? Who can update? Who can read? There's more databases, obviously, than the user database. So trust. I tried to find a very short explanation, and this is the shortest one I found. <laughs> so it's a subjective assessment of another's influence in terms of the extent of one's perception about the quality and significance of another's impact over one's outcome in a given situation, such that one's expectation of blah, 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 blah. Yeah, right. Everybody gets it. In other words, trust is subjective. We decide who we trust. So there's no thing that we call absolute trust anywhere. We, we need to build our own trust infrastructure if we, if we want to use something internally. We decide, or we decide we trust someone else's infrastructure. It does not guarantee absolute truth. It doesn't mean it's correct, but it means we at least trust them to do a better job than what we can do, figuring it out. Or the one who's caller, if I trust someone else, that one is more likely to do, to do the correct thing than the app uh, wanting to list transactions. Yeah, it helps us predict the correctness of the decision. And this is pretty nice. So given that I trust the data coming from a, some party, if that's correct, my decision will be correct. That's super useful. So in trust, we have pretty much three participants if we want to centralize trust. We have some sort of issuer, authority. We have some party who's requesting some data, some party who's relying on that. I'll explain. Back to me. <laughs> when this picture was taken, it was sunny. I was at some cafe, like I said before. If we show this to someone, we can say that. This was, this was true then. If, if someone else shows another picture at some other time, those properties may be different. 
we call that context attributes. So given all attributes about a subject or about a user, some are context, some are actually subject attributes. Some say more things about the identity than others. So context attributes, it's good to know the difference between these, because context attributes we can use to determine um, the risk factor, for instance, when you're logging in. The context, where are you? Sweden. Where were you last time you logged in? Five minutes ago. Denmark. Where in Denmark? Copenhagen, Stockholm. Not likely. Geovelocity is too high. Maybe we should block your next login. That's what context is useful for. It's useful for more things than that, obviously. But um, that's a the difference. They change. <clears throat> Uh, the subject attributes, on the other hand, of course, they're super different per application, what, what a subject attribute is, but they have this characteristic of, of describing me, my dig digital persona, if you will. So these are attributes, and if I were to go to someone, in, in, at least in Sweden, I could say, show them my passport and say, this is me, I'm 177 centimeters tall, this is my name. And if they trust the police who issues passports in Sweden, they believe that information to be correct. They can also look up in Skatteverket and see, are you really the father of your son here? Yes. So those two authorities are asserting parties when it comes to information about me as a citizen in Sweden, for instance. Simple as that. But we cannot trust attributes, like I just explained. We trust the police, we trust Skatteverket. Uh, to be providing the correct information, so we cannot trust them. They are providing something called claims. So an attribute is simple. It's first name equals Jacob, age equals 38, whereas a claim is a statement. Scott Tverkett says, the first name of this person is Jacob. Jacob is 38, says the police. Jacob has a son, says Scott Tverkett. Jacob is 177 centimeters tall, says the police. You see the form here. We have a subject, Jacob. We have an attribute or a property, is 177 centimeters tall, and an asserting party, an issuer or authority, if you will, says the police. That's a claim. Somebody claims something to be true. So how can we trust this? How can we use claims then? Well, obviously, if I need to trust the incoming data, I can always verify incoming data against the original source. That's dumb. Um, then I must just get it on my own. Or we could use a common party to issue this trusted data, like we do. And we have the issuer, we have the requesting party, we have the relying party. So if I need to send a request to the relying party, say I want to list all the transactions, for instance, um, I can say, hey, I need information about the phone number about Jacob, so that I can send it. The issuer then says, sure, here's information about Jacob. Use that when you're making your request to the relying party. The relying party needs to verify this. And obviously, it could go and check. But what we usually do is we sign this data. Um, the issuer and the authority I intermix those words because there's really many names for it depending on what standard or what spec you're looking for. Um, has a public key or a private key and it signs the data. And then the relying party has the public part of that key and can verify the signature. By that we know that nobody has tampered with the data on the way and that it came from the issuer and authority. So as long as you don't go and lose your private key, it's pretty safe to issue data. It's not encrypted, so anyone can see it still. It's just asserted. It's a claim now. We claim this data to be true. So if you trust that issuer and authority, you can use this structure. And you do all the time. I mean, HTTPS, it works like this, essentially. So everybody's thinking, hey, I can use a jot. That's signed data, isn't it? Yeah, it is, actually. We have a header in the JOT, we have a payload, and we have a signature. The green part is the signature. So JOTs are actually useful for this type of scenarios. That's why they exist, even. And mm -mm -mm. 
if you think about it, these are actually claims. So when you open up the JOT, all you see is claims. And it's a bit slow today. Let me see if I can get that to change. Yep, there we go. There's even a subject in there. So we have the subject Jane Doe at example.com, and we can now derive that the subscriber ID for that subject is ABC123, or that the name is Jane Doe. Interesting. And we also have the issuer in there. We can see that this was issued by login.curity.io. If you trust login.curity.io and you use the public key of login.curity.io, you can verify that these claims are actually true. So using the JOT, obviously, yeah, I mean, that's what you should be sending around in your network. It's simple as that. But a JOT is not a protocol. I don't know how many discussions I've had with, with organizations where we're like talking about OAuth and, and you know, moving up the ladder of security. And, and they're like, nah, we're pretty good. We, we, we just took JOTs, actually, and we're good now. So we implemented JOTs, and we got API security. And that's, that's really dumb, actually. Because if you think about it, a jot is like a car. And you take your car and you go out and, and drive on the streets, on the freeway, for instance. And it's not the car that makes you safe. It's the traffic rules. So you're pretty sure that people will drive in the same direction on the freeway because of the rules. And same thing with a jot. It's not the jot that makes it secure. It's the protocol that you use along with the JOT that makes it secure. Because if you use the JOT the wrong way, you're screwed. You didn't add any security. You obfuscated stuff at best. So, well, I'm going to skip this, actually. <laughs> so there are two protocols, uh, OAuth in the base, and built on top of OAuth, we have OpenID. So these two use JOTs, or they can use JOT. OAuth doesn't actually require you to, but it's a handy token to use in OAuth. So if we want to use claims, then let's go back to claims in OAuth um, and OpenID. I would have an app, say that I want to do a, a list transactions. So I go and do a code flow to the, to the server, uh, perhaps an OpenID code flow. And the server will log me in and look up stuff and say, yeah, there's a, there's a phone number here. I'll add that to the access token, which this time is perhaps a JSON web token or not, but some sort of trusted token. Inside that token, we can now see that Jane Doe at example.com has the phone number 12312323. So there's no chance anyone can break that API. And just using it, we're just passing it on. And the protocol states, this is an access token, so you, there are rules for how you can send it around. There are rules for how you can obtain one. There are rules for how you should check that it's valid, and so on. That's the point that adds security here. So how do, you, how do you figure out what to stick in the token then? Well, we call them attribute sources. Uh, attributes, per se, is a, is a pretty old thing. came already from SAML, who had a lot of attribute stuff going on back and forth. And you connect your sort of central party to these attribute sources, obviously. And they can be anything. They, just, they don't have to be only account information. They can be any relevant identity information that you want to have sort of centralized trust around. So you make sure those are connected to your OAuth and OpenID provider, not to everywhere in your network where you need the data. So what about the data then in the, in the token? Well, first of all, like I said, you should try to organize this data so that it's not reachable by everybody in the network at least not unauthenticated and not using the proper sort of authorization mechanisms to get it. So preferably, you should stick it in the token already so you have it centrally. Yeah. <laughs> you should use opaque tokens, uh, tokens on the internet and JOTs internally. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about that. I just talk about JOTs all the time now. Uh, there's a flow called the phantom token flow. Uh, if you Google that, you'll find some interesting uh, stuff. We talk about it sometimes. Um, essentially, swap tokens. Because JOTs are usually not encrypted, 
Uh, we can talk about that after why they're not. They can be, but they're not. <laughs> um, and use Jots internally, because they're faster and easier to pass around. And here's the thing, though. Only add data to a token if the client and the API need it. Don't go and add the whole world just because you have everything. Don't do that. Just squeeze it down to the thing you know is going to be used. That's a bit tricky, but it's doable. So how do you identify this data, then? I need to speed up a bit, I see. Well, first of all, it should be relevant to a large set of your APIs. 90%, 80%, maybe the 80-20 rule, but not less than that. So if most need it, most of the time, it's good. It's useful to be in a token at some point. It should not be application specific. Uh, by that meaning, you know, one single API needs this one time out of a thousand. It should be attributes about the user. You should be getting that by now. And it should not be contextual to the session. So we have this context subject attribute thing, right? Why, why shouldn't I put the location in the token? Right? Makes sense. The API wants to know. Where are you? Well, the thing about context is, in OAuth, tokens can live for a very long time. They get refreshed and refreshed and refreshed, so they can be refreshed for many years. Depends on your application. So how you logged in is pretty irrelevant I mean, even an hour after you logged in, it's pretty irrelevant. It's likely you've left your computer and went back. So that information is stale. So if you put that in the token, it's, it's, it's hard to use. And that's why we don't put contextual information in tokens, usually. OK. <clears throat> that was a lot. Part three. Scopes revisited. I'm going to stop here and do a quick demo instead. And, and see what we're talking about here before we talk about the last stuff. So we have, there's a tool we developed uh, that's free to use. Um, it's called OAuth.tools. And it's useful if you just want to toy around with OAuth and, and run some flows. It works against any, com any, any sort of standard OAuth and OpenID Connect server. Um, so you set up an environment where your server is, and it will find all the endpoints if it supports metadata. Otherwise, you type it in. You find all the public keys and, and stuff like that. Super handy tool. And then you can start flows. So you can run any, any flow in OAuth and OpenID and simply configure it with the parameters you want. So I've set up a code flow here. And I have a client called Tools. And I also have a scope, OpenID. So it's actually an OpenID code flow for those interested. And it shows me here, if I, if I would do this in a, a code this somewhere, this is the, the URL I should go to. So I can copy this in and, and paste it in my code or try it in, in the browser on my own if I want. Or I can just run it. I also selected that I should auto-redeem the code so that the code flow has two parts. The first part re retrieves a code over a redirect back. The second part takes a post uh, to the back end and gets the tokens. So it auto does that, so I don't have to click stuff. So sends me over to the OWA server, logging in with some fake user. See if internet works, yes. So this is a content consent page in OWASH. You know how you have to sometimes approve, like, does this client, is this client allowed to access your stuff on this application? And currently, it's only user ID, yes. OK, I got back. I got an access token, which is opaque in this case. I got a refresh token and an ID token. I can see the ID token has some, some data, the issuer, for instance, and stuff like that. If I look at the access token, I can introspect that here. Uh, it makes an introspection call if the client supports that. Uh, I can see the, the claims in that access token. So it doesn't really matter if it's a JOT or not uh, from, from sort of OAuth's perspective. Um, but I talked about scopes before, but now let's talk about claims. So actually, in OpenID, you can ask for claims. So you don't have to go and ask for, for everything at once. You can simply say, I want to have the email claims, which are two claims, actually, email and email verified. And I want these to end up in the ID token and the 
user info endpoint. And the request parameter is a JSON object that looks like this. It has some sort of token sync. And then uh, what values should go in there? What claim names? And if it's null there, it says any value on this claim. Um, so it says user info and ID token. I can also, uh, depends on your server, but you can add custom claims here. So we say I want the foo claim. And perhaps I expect a value of bar. And I want this to go into only user info and access token, for instance. So it adds the access token as a sync, the foo claim with a, an expected value of bar. The spec is a bit vague here. This is a, it's a big philosophical question of what should happen here. Um, but let's assume this. This is nice. This updates the, the claims parameter of the request now. It's URL encoded, so it looks a bit silly. But that's, that's what happens. So when you make the authorized request, you pass in this claims parameter, and this now scopes down the request and says, these are the claims I'm looking for. We're not using the scope parameter now. We're using the claims parameter. And if I would send this, I also added two, log uh, two OpenID settings here which is the prompt parameter saying prompt equals login, prompt equals consent. This means that it doesn't use any SSO sessions or anything, so I will always be prompted, which is handy in a demo. So once again, have to log in. And let's wait for the consent screen to show up. So now it actually asks me for email, verified email, the foo claim, and the user ID still. And I, as a user, could even say, uh, let's ignore the, the email or verified email claim, and those would then be dropped. So let's look at that. So what did I get? Well, in the ID token, as we see, I have email, email verified. And in the access token, what do I have there? I don't have email and email verified because they weren't specified for that uh, sync. And if I make a request to the user info endpoint, which is another open ID endpoint where I can fetch other user, uh, user profile data, so to speak. This is, this is the only information that's being released because this, this is the only thing the client asked for. Email verified, foo came out here, like we saw, and the email. That's the claims parameter, super useful. So anyway, um, with that in mind, now we're gonna dive into some, some more complex stuff real quick. There are no scopes. <laughs> so we just talked about scopes, and I used the word scopes. But we had, a, we had a super, super long session reading the spec over and over again to figure out what's wrong with the OpenID spec, until we realized there are no scopes. What, am, what do I mean? Well, there's something called scope. There's nothing called scopes. Nitpicking a bit here, but it, it, it kind of has a meaning. Scope was introduced in OAuth 2. There's never been anything like it before. OAuth 1A didn't have it, SAML didn't have it. It's, it's a new concept. It, what it meant was scope of access. So scope, like I said before, it was these strings. Well, actually, the scope parameter is scope equals string space separated values. Read, write, open ID. So it's really just one thing, it's scope. And that whole thing together is the scope of access that I want this client to have. Um, the thing, that if you really want to talk about the individual items in that string, the spec says scope value or scope tokens. Uh, but we usually say scopes. But that's actually kind of incorrect. So if we talk about claims versus scopes, this is where it gets interesting. Scope is a grouping of claims. That's what OpenID says. So it's kind of a macro, a shorthand, to get more data into your token. Um, the thing about scope, though, is it, it doesn't cover complex stuff. It's too broad. Like, um, so we needed something more fine-grained, and that's what OpenID came up with. It's in the core spec. Um, so here's an example. In OpenID, there's a profile scope, and it maps to these claims, these claim names, to be specific. Name, family name, given name, blah, 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 blah. Each of these claims has a specific value once resolved, once we start issuing stuff. So there's a grouping here. 
there's actually several groupings. We have the profile scope, we have the OpenID scope, which implicitly has a bunch of groupings. The subject, the user, if you ask for OpenID, you will get a user ID in there. It's not possible to not get that. Uh, auth time, ACR, stuff like that. The email scope maps to two claims, one called the same thing, the email claim, which has the value of the email. The email verified claim, which is a Boolean, true or false, like we saw before. Address claim just maps to address. Phone, phone number, phone number verified. So these, these are there so that the client can say, hey, I need phone. And of course, it's possible to do custom groupings. You can say, hey, we have product two, so let's make a scope product two. Claim one, claim two are in product two. That can be pretty useful, because now we can start designing, OK, we have this API. It needs these things. It needs claim one, claim two in order to do something. It needs phone number to be able to list transactions. Well, add that to the scope of access that that client needs. That's a way to do it. Or have the client specifically ask for the claims that it needs. There depends. That's a discussion what to use where. But the thing is, if we start being better at querying for the data we think should go in uh, to the tokens we need, we require less things for the user to consent to. Imagine when you actually ask for the profile scope. That's the list of claims the user will have to consent to. And all of a sudden, the user starts thinking, why do you need my nickname? What are you going to do with my nickname? I'm going to just, my email should be enough, right? So you're, you're asking for a lot. And, and in, in Europe today, I mean, we, we don't want to be asking for a lot of consent for stuff we don't need, because it's twofold. It also goes into, you have to deal with it. If you get that data released, it's your problem then. GDPR-wise, it's your problem if it's in your service. So the less you get, the better, right? Um, more private, both for the user, better for the company. Um, and we can do finer grained authorizations. So if the client would ask for the email scope, and the user would be presented with email, email verified, and then would say, I'm not going to tell you if it's verified or not. The client actually has to be a bit smart. It has to know, OK, um, what do I do if this didn't happen, if I didn't get it? The thing is, if all the claims in a scope aren't released, so if someone decides, no, you're not going to get both claims in this scope, you don't get the scope. So as you can see here, you requested the email scope. The user denied you email verified, which means you get the email claim back, but you don't get the email scope back because it's not fulfilled. You don't have the whole scope of access for email. So the response parameter claims can tell you which claims did you get, but the scope parameter won't tell you what you got. So what does this do with access control? Say that we have an application. Now we're getting pretty, pretty gory here. Um, where we have scope-based scope access control and claims-based access control. So we have scope A, B, and C. And let's assume we ask for all three scopes. And everything is granted. User says OK, server says OK. But the application actually only needed the claim A1 here. So you asked for everything, you got everything, but you didn't need everything. So application only needed A1. In both cases, everything is fine. Scope A is there, claim A1 is there. You're good to go. But same example. You ask for ABC, but the user is picky and deselects stuff and says, or the server decides, nah. I'm not going to give you claim A3, for instance, because, you know, it happens. So A1, 2, 4 is granted. B1, C1, 2 is granted, which means scope B is there because you got everything in scope B. Scope C is there because you got everything in scope C. Scope A is not there because you didn't get A3. But the application didn't need A3. It needed A1. So with scope-based access control, you wouldn't get access. You're too coarse grained. Whereas in claims based access control, you would, because all you need was A1. So this, this sort of has this issue of like, it, it's currently being used a lot. OAuth and OpenID is used where you ask for as much privilege as you can in the beginning, and you never step up. And this, this doesn't scale for us. I mean, with the privacy regulations and other things coming up, 
We cannot keep doing that. So claims based access control is what we need. And it's actually quite easy to use once you start having it, because you know if something comes into the token, I know it's true. I can operate on it. I can work my data. And I'm good to go. So building logic around the sort of, if, if you know authorization, there's something called attribute-based access control, or ABAC, um, which is having a few standards around it. The, the prominent one, but that didn't really get adoption that much, is SACML. Uh, but there are other things now, like uh, OPA, Open uh, Authorization, Open Policy Agent, uh, used in Kubernetes sometimes. These work on attribute-based authorization. An attribute authorization requires attributes. They need data. And if you can provide that data from a trusted source, you're likely to do the right thing. You're likely to make the correct decision. It's not guaranteed, obviously, but it's likely. All right, um, time to summarize. You should trust as few parts as possible in your network. Keep it to a minimum. Put an OAuth server somewhere safe, an OpenID Connect provider if you need one. Connect them to your attribute sources, and then make your applications trust that. If you need to trust another cloud service, well, make your OAuth server trust that then, so that you make sort of a nice chain of trust, rather than having trust spread out. Because if you start having trust spread out, you're boiling spaghetti. And don't make jots everywhere. Do not construct a jot and send it to the next one, just because then it's more secure or easy. Because you're starting to introduce these sort of snippets of pasta all over. And it's going to be hard to untangle after a while. Attributes are not claims. We have first name Jacob, or Jane, last name Dope. They're attributes. Claims. Oh, sorry. There are no scopes. There is only scope. They represent the grouping of claims. Good takeaway. And claims are pretty easy. The car is blue. Driver's phone number is one, two, three. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>